Welcome back, everyone. I'm sure you've all heard about these quarantines. I'm sure you've all heard about this coronavirus spreading everywhere. And I'm sure maybe like a lot of us, you're a little uh, concerned about your health or your family's health. And so today we have with us Dr. Paul Saladino to talk some sense into us. <laughs> so, Paul, it's great having you on the call. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. I'm excited to talk about it because I really think that there, the conversation needs to shift a little bit. Yeah, and so Paul is here to talk to us about fixing your immune system, not, not derailing your entire life out of panic, but doing the things you need to do to make sure you're healthy enough to deal with issues like this. Make your body strong enough to be able to resist illnesses like this. Because not everyone that catches these things dies. It's like what, like but 3% at most, 2%? What, you know the, uh, the yeah. number currently? Yeah. Yeah, and to be fair, Coronavirus is a virulent virus, right? It's a little more uh, contagious. It's a little more virulent, which means it's going to affect people more strongly than a seasonal flu. But who is it affecting? It's affecting the people in the population who have a weakened immune system. Generally, it's affecting the elderly and the frail. And we all know people in our lives who are going to be a little bit affected by this virus, who may be at risk of being harmed by the virus. But the conversation for me has been a little bit misguided. I don't like that the conversation is so much about hysteria and fear and powerlessness. That doesn't really feel good as a human. That just feels like scary. And it, it really paralyzes us as a human people. That's not what I want to see. You know, as a physician, I want to try and help shift the conversation to empower people to understand that we have power over the illnesses, the infectious diseases that we are going to experience for the rest of our lives on this planet. Coronavirus is not the first, it's not the last. You know, we've had H1N1 flu, we've had bird flu, we've had Zika, we've had MRSA, MRSA's methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And what do we know about all of these infectious illnesses? Some of them are viruses, some of them are bacteria. What do we know about all of them? It's all about how healthy we are as people, right? It's all about how healthy I am as a human and whether I am strong enough from an immunologic perspective to withstand the disease. Historically, there was a debate that happened many, many years ago, over hundreds of years ago, between Louis Pasteur and another physician. And Louis Pasteur, people may know Louis Pasteur, he was the guy that discovered kind of germ theory and penicillin and, and this idea that, that bacteria can be fought by antibiotics. And he had a debate with another physician and Louis Pasteur believed incorrectly that it was about the virulence of the microbe. And the other physician believed it was about the terrain and which is how healthy we are as humans that really matters most. And unfortunately, Louis Pasteur's ideas have been adopted and the other physician has been forgotten. But the take home message is that it's more about, it's so much more about how healthy we are as humans, how robust, how many swords and spears and how much armor our immune system has rather than the strength of any particular virus or bacteria. Hmm, interesting. So what, what are some of the main, if you're going to give us maybe a quick list, then we'll jump into it deeper. What are the main things people can do to strengthen their immune systems? So it starts, and this may not be surprising, although I don't think I've heard anyone have this conversation yet in the media. It starts with diet, right? It starts with the food we eat. What are the foods that we can eat that give us the nutrients we need to be healthy humans and to have a healthy immune system. All of the systems of our body are connected. So we can't pull out the immune system and say, you can have a healthy immune system, but an unhealthy heart. You can have a healthy immune system, but an unhealthy brain. It's the same conversation. How do we get healthy hearts, healthy brains, and healthy immune systems? It's by getting the nutrients we need to really be strong humans. And this is perhaps where um, I think that I can add some unique things to the conversation because yeah, that's right. I just wrote I know a book. You, uh, as I say, yeah, you wrote a book actually about proper diet. So yeah, tell us about what you yes. what you studied. And what, well, what's your what's your book first? But what have you what have you studied? What have you found? Yeah, so my book is called The Carnivore Code, and there is so much plant based rhetoric these days, and so many people are talking about plant based diets, and I wanted to write a book that really debunked all of the myths about meat, all of the myths incorrectly vilifying meat and animal foods. I really wanted to write a book because I feel so strongly that well-raised meat and animal foods are the single best source 
of critical nutrients for humans on this planet. And if we eliminate those from our diet, we are going to be much more susceptible to illnesses because there are so many nutrients only found in animal foods that we need to be healthy humans. People think of plant foods like kale or spinach as superfoods. And in the book, I make a striking case against that. And I say, no, we've been told wrong. We've been misled. Just like we've been misled into hysteria about coronavirus, we've been misled to, into thinking that kale and spinach are the real superfoods or goji berries or something. When in fact, if we actually look at where humans get bioavailable nutrients and special bioavailable nutrients, they are only found in animal foods. What am I talking about? I'm talking about things like choline. Choline is a precursor for a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. It's needed to make every membrane in the human body. And it's only found in significant amounts in animal foods. I'm talking about carnitine and anserine and taurine. These are all amino acid derivatives that are only found in significant amounts in animal foods. And these are intimately tied to the health and robustness of our immune system. And the list goes on and on. Creatine, carnosine, B12, people will be familiar with that. Vitamin K2, these are all critical nutrients that humans need to be healthy. And guess what? You can't get them in any significant amount unless you're eating well-raised animal foods. So the message that I want people to hear and I talk about this in my book, The Carnivore Code, is that animal foods have been incorrectly vilified and that to be the healthiest human we can be to really thrive, we should be eating meat and eggs and animal organs if we're comfortable with that, like liver. Hmm. That's interesting. I was talking to a doctor the other day actually about amino acids and immune system. He was, he was saying amino acids are like the secret weapon against viruses. I mean, now what, what, what's your take on amino acids? Can you explain this to us? I mean, are these really as significant as they, this guy made it sound at least when it comes to your immune system? I totally agree with that. And, and I mentioned three of them, you know, I mentioned uh, carnitine and anserine and taurine. These are all amino acids and amino acid derivatives that, that are critical for the health of our immune system. And Broadly speaking, amino acids are nitrogen containing molecules that, that make up all the muscles of our body. But what we know is that when we are looking at animal foods versus plant foods, we can get so many more amino acids, so much more bioavailable protein from animal foods. And I talk about this in the book as well. I have a chart clearly illustrating that when we are eating meat, we are absorbing so much more of the amino acids, so many more of the proteins in that food than we are versus plants. And this has been, I think, wrongly talked to us, wrongly communicated from plant-based circles saying, you can get all the protein you need from pea protein or from, from the plants you're eating. And that's just false. That's just plain false. Unless people are eating a highly processed, usually very contaminated plant protein, like a hemp protein or a pea protein, those are extremely contaminated. They're really not good for humans at all for many reasons. Unless you're eating like a synthetic plant protein, humans are not going to get enough protein. Protein is a building block for all of our muscles and all of the things in our body that kind of make the enzymatic machinery work. And that is something we have to get from animal foods if we really want to thrive. And so protein is composed of amino acids, right? You eat protein, it gets broken down to amino acids, and then you sort of reassemble those amino acids into every enzymatic system, every kind of tendon and nerve in your body. Protein is the scaffolding that makes us who we are. And we can really absorb much more of it and special amino acid components from animal foods. So carnitine, anserine, taurine, people may not have heard of these, clearly linked to improved immune function. Where do we get them? Not in, not in plant foods, only in animal foods. Hmm. You know, okay, kind of an off the wall question here maybe, but what about milk? Because uh, I mean, this is, this is where I'm at. I'm seeing everyone's drinking now almond milk, oat milk, soy milk, all these things. And I, I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, is there like a conspiracy against like cows or something? Is, it, is this part <laughs> of this like, this like farting cow, you know, <laughs> Green New Deal thing or something that they're, they're just trying to get rid of cows? Like what's wrong with milk? I mean, now what's your take on it? Milk good for you or bad for you? And what about all these milk replacements? I think the milk replacements are much worse for humans than real cow's milk. And I would agree with you completely 
there is a conspiracy to get rid of milk. There is a conspiracy to get rid of cows. And we can get into the environmental stuff if you want. I break this all down in my book. The cow farts, oh my goodness, so misleading. To suggest that, that ruminants, so ruminants are like cows and sheep and buffalo, to suggest that any of the gases that come out of ruminants are significantly contributing to, to climate change is to really not understand the environmental literature. That's a little off topic for us today, but I talk about it all in the book. And I debunk that myth along with all of the other myths about red meat being bad for us in any way, shape or form. But, you know, you're right. Milk is just another thing that people are trying to vilify when, in fact, it's from well-raised cattle. Um, this is grass fed, grass finished cattle that are raised properly. It can be very healthy for humans and is used by indigenous cultures all over the world. The Maasai use milk and are robustly healthy. And if you really look at the data, if you look at the studies with milk, my goodness, it's been associated with fantastically improved health outcomes for so many people. If people are trying to consider milk, cow's milk from a grass-fed, grass-finished animal versus an oat milk or an almond milk, there's no comparison in terms of nutrient quality, absorbability, you know, bioavailability of nutrients or frank, absolute nutrient content. In the book, I actually talk about one study that was done with kids who had urinary issues and these kids had either bleeding with urination or urinary pain or problems um, with urinating in general. And when they eliminated almond milk from these kids' diets, they all got better. So almonds mm. are, again, held up as a very valuable thing or a health food. And I think that really almonds are a plant seed and plants don't want their seeds to get eaten. I talk about all of this in the book, how we've got the perspective completely wrong with regard to plants and plants are often much more toxic than we believe them to be. And so when you make a milk or a beverage out of almonds, it's full of things that really prevent the digestion of that almond milk. It's full of digestive enzyme inhibitors. And it's really not full of many nutrients that humans can absorb because the nutrients in the almonds are chelated. They're kind of, they're bitten. There's a molecule in almonds called phytic acid that bites onto minerals and prevents our absorption of most of the minerals in almonds. And so people will say, oh, almonds are high in magnesium. Well, you can't absorb that magnesium in order, you know, when you drink the milk because it's chelated by phytic acid. So we come back to the same story. If we want to absorb vitamins and minerals and amino acids, animal foods are clearly better for us. So the, the whole oat milk and almond milk thing, if you read the label, it becomes painfully clear what's going on here. They're fortified with synthetic vitamins because there's no nutrition in there. And they're fortified mm. with things to make them palatable, like sugars. Um, so I really fear this movement toward these synthetic milks away from cow's milk. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned the red meat, red meat conspiracy. Now, red meat, you said it's good for you. Of course, we've all heard mixed things about it. Tell us about it. Yeah, red meat is very good for humans. We've always eaten red meat throughout our existence as humans. In the book, the first couple of chapters of the book are an examination of where we've come from as humans and looking at the size of the human brain. What we know pretty clearly is that the human brain really rapidly exploded in size right about the time that we started eating meat. There's evidence for hunting, evidence for stone tools. It all correlates with when the human brain began to rapidly increase in size. Eating meat made us human and has always been a critical component of who we are as humans. It's made us into the, uh, the creative and resourceful and strong beings that we are today. And it's allowed us to do creative things. It's allowed you and I to sit here across the internet and do amazing things because the nutrients in red meat, again, help us grow bigger brains. Which nutrients am I talking about? B12 is a big one. We can correlate the size of human brains with the amount of B12 in their bloodstream, meaning that those who have less B12 have smaller brains, and those who have more B12 have bigger brains. This is from a study at Oxford that I also discuss in the book. And who do you think has less B12? Any guesses? People who are not eating animal foods because we can't get B12 from plant foods, right? So there are studies that really show that vegans and vegetarians have smaller brains. This isn't a good thing. And kind of like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast or the beginning of this TV show, if you have a smaller brain, you probably have a weaker immune system because the nutrients we need to grow big brains are the same nutrients we need to make healthy immune systems and healthy cells. So I think that there really is a conspiracy against meat. And I think it's coming from 
a lot of these plant-based circles who are trying to get us to buy really highly processed plant-based products. One of the things that people will quickly realize is that plant-based foods are not really profitable unless they're processed. Really processed food is the only profitable food out there. Farmers aren't making money selling lettuce or avocados, not a whole lot of money. Nobody's getting like, it's not lucrative, but people are getting really, really rich selling us processed food, whether it's processed animal food or processed plant food. And so I think there's so much of a push to get us humans to eat more processed food. Now, what have we seen recently in the last few years? These plant-based burgers. These are processed food. Like, like, like this They're miracle, what's that, miracle burger they call it or something like that? <laughs> they impossible say can, uh, burger. Yeah, impossible yeah. burger. It has so much estrogen that makes a man grow, you know. Yeah, yeah. Man makes, boobs it, within it, it like, has, uh, if they eat a, a handful of them or something. Yeah. Well, it has Allegedly. so much soy. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so it has yeah. so much soy in it. And soy is known to activate estrogen receptors in the human body. There's a 17 beta estradiol receptor in the human body and soy compounds in soy clearly bind to and trigger that receptor. So the burgers don't have real estrogen, but they have compounds that mimic estrogen in the human mm. body. So we joke, you know, I had a podcast recently. My podcast is called Fundamental Health. And I joked on there with a guest recently that impossible burgers make it impossible to lead a healthy life. And but impossible burgers are processed food. And so I think that advertisers, multinational corporations want us to eat processed plant food. They want us to eat this junk food and plant-based burgers are junk food. They're not healthy, they're not real food. If people read the ingredients, they're vegetable oil and cellulose from bamboo and soy protein, everything in there is processed. There's nothing that is actually a whole food in a plant-based burger. And so. And then when we are looking at why animal foods have been vilified or the evidence that is used against animal foods, and this is a very important point, it's all observational research. It's called epidemiology. There's no experiment here. And we hear this every week. Red meat intake is associated with a shorter life or with more heart disease. And that key word associated always gets overlooked by the media. There's no experiment here. No one can say red meat causes a shorter life or red meat causes heart disease because actual interventional experiments where they have a control group and they do an experiment with a variable, they'll either put in red meat or take red meat out of the diet. Those type of interventional experiments clearly show that red meat is very good for humans. But the epidemiology, the observational research that is only done with surveys is quite misleading. So what they'll do is they'll take a group of people and they'll ask them, what have you eaten over the last 10 years? Can you remember? And the people will say, well, I ate this many hamburgers and this many eggs and this much broccoli and this much asparagus. Well, okay. And so what we find in, in some, but not all epidemiology studies is that the people who eat more meat have worse outcomes. And at first glance you say, okay, meat, meat could be causing worse outcomes. But what we're missing here, and I think this quickly becomes apparent to people when they think about it for just a few more seconds, is that you can't make a causation. You can't draw a causative inference based on that study. That's all correlation. What do people who eat more meat eat the meat with? French fries, milkshakes, buns from McDonald's, right? When was the last time you went to a barbecue and saw someone only eating meat? They're eating meat with coleslaw and junk food and hamburgers with donuts or cookies. So you can't separate all this out in epidemiology research. And that's what's so misleading here and why interventional studies are so critical. And as I talk about in the book, when we look at actual real interventional studies where they take someone's diet, they take a group of subjects in a real experiment and they take carbohydrates out of the diet and they add red meat back in, what do they see? improvements in inflammatory markers, improvements in diabetes and weight loss. So how can red meat be bad for us when the actual experiments show that it's good for us? It's not bad for us. It's that we've been misled by faulty, uh, really inaccurate research that was never meant to draw causative inference. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. So you, your take is our focus when facing these kinds of outbreaks. I mean, really, I, I was laughing with a coworker the other day. I was like, you know, like what are people, what are people gonna do? Like, there's only so much you can do. Like, lock yourself in your house. Okay, cities on lockdown. You know, you mentioned you're Italian. I was, I said I have an Italian coworker actually, 
who, um, you know, Italy's on lockdown right now with this coronavirus. He has family members who can't travel out of their, out of their towns. And, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, other than just panic, other than just worry, other than, I don't know, just wait around. But it's true that there's maybe proactive steps we can take to protect ourselves, which is really come down to maybe just living a healthier lifestyle. Is this your take? That's absolutely my take because panic and hysteria solves nothing. And I think panic and hysteria really paralyzes us as people. And that's not a good place to be. We don't want to be deer in the headlights. We should all, we're all intelligent, resourceful people. We need to have action steps. And I think it's all about living a healthy life. And it goes beyond food. It goes to sleep and exercise and being in real sunlight, right? We can talk about that too, but it starts with diet. And that's what I wanted to talk about in my book. And I didn't write the book for coronavirus, but it's very relevant to talk about it right now. And the book just came out a few weeks ago. The book is about how to be healthy and how we've been so misled. So yes, as we talked about so far in the show, the key is I want to empower people to realize that, that meat is not bad for us, that it's been incorrectly vilified. And if you really wanna be healthy, it should be a large part of your diet, especially from well-raised sources. We are not powerless against coronavirus or any other infection. And as I stated at the beginning of the program, we all certainly know people who may be negatively affected by this virus, and we should encourage them to do the same. If people want to protect their parents or their grandparents who may be old and frail, we should be getting them to eat nutrient rich animal foods. We should be eating, you know, we should be eating a steak with them. We should be eating liver with our grandparents. We should be eating eggs with our grandparents. So often the elderly end up on what are called tea and toast diets. They just drink, you know, kind of fluids and eat white bread with butter or something. And it's, that's really going to impair their immune system. That's why they become frail because how often do you see elderly people eating these nutrient rich animal foods not as often as you'd like because they're more complex to prepare. They don't go to the grocery store. Who is eating the most processed food? It's elderly people because that's what's convenient. So if we want to protect ourselves and to protect the people we love who are older or maybe a little more frail from this virus, we need to help them. We need to be brave enough to go out of the house, to go to the grocery store, to bring them good food and eat a steak or a pot roast or a, a hamburger, maybe without a bun, a bunless hamburger, you know, with our with our parents or our grandparents, maybe even eat some liver if we like liver, eat some eggs. These are the foods that are gonna help us be nutritionally replete and strong. And I know it's a message that's quite interesting for people and they may not have heard before, but I think it's a very important message and I'm happy to be able to offer something that empowers people. Yeah, my, my grandpa just had his 80th birthday and the guy is like a miracle of science, according to, you know, what they say in the news and stuff like that, because he eats meat like he wouldn't believe. He eats, you know, drinks a six pack of beer a day. <laughs> he still smokes a lot. He's an old, <laughs> old retired Marine. But uh, yeah, he does, he does not shy away from red meat. He loads up his morning uh, breakfast plate with bacon. The guy's healthy as an ox. It's crazy. <laughs> You know? And, you know, I, I think yeah. that that's, that's interesting. The anecdotes are fascinating and there is nuance there, right? I think we're going to say the beer probably isn't good for him, but maybe the meat is helping. <laughs> yeah. and that, you well, know, that, that the, recapitulates. The funny, thing, yeah. the funny thing. So he goes to the doctor, right? And the doctor's like, he's like, you drink? He's like, yep. He goes, you smoke? He goes, yep. He goes, you want to quit? He goes, nope. He goes, doc, I feel like if I quit everything, it would, it would shock my system and I'd die. <laughs> and the doctor looks at me, he goes, you know what? I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. But no, somehow, well, somehow he's just, he, he's, he keeps an active lifestyle. He, yeah, he does, he, he eats very well. He never changes diet. He never followed these, you know, fads and things like that. He, uh, he eats a lot of meat. He gets out, he's, he's happy, he reads a lot, and uh, yeah, that's a, maybe yeah, all it takes, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that the meat is helping him. I think we could both agree that the cigarettes and the alcohol are not helping him, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you, you I don't want, I don't want to reinforce that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, like, maybe the meat is, maybe the meat is counteracting it for him and, and helping him, you know, deal with some of those toxins and the other things, but I think this message is clear. I don't want people to be feel powerless in the face of this infection because there will be more infections after coronavirus. In a few months, I really think that within six months, coronavirus will be, you know, kind of over and done with. 
and 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 there will be more infections probably in a year or two there will be more infections like this and it, it's the same conversation every time it's wow this is a very virulent thing you should be afraid you should be afraid there's nothing you can do and i think that's not true at all there's plenty you can do and i've come out publicly on my social media on instagram and other accounts and said i'm a doctor and i am not afraid of coronavirus you know if i could go to china and volunteer to help i would if i could go to italy and volunteer to help i would um, and because I, I, I know, I strongly believe that my immune system is robust because I am thinking very intentionally about the foods I am eating and making sure that I get those critical amino acids, those critical proteins, those critical nutrients, vitamin A. We didn't even talk about vitamin A and vitamin K2 and vitamin B12 that will allow me to be strong as a human. And so I'm not afraid of it. And I'm not saying no one needs to be afraid of it. Like I said at the beginning, I think that if people are sick, they should seek medical care. And if we know people in our lives who may be affected more, um, more dangerously, who are frail, we should help them become healthier by making sure they are getting nutrient-rich foods. And we talked about what those foods are in detail. So Dr. Paul, I guess we all heard it here now, meet the original superfood. <laughs> I say that in my book. You took the words right out of my oh, mouth. Really? Oh, really? I haven't There's read it yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole chapter in my book. I, I should have gotten a book. I, I should have had a book here to show you, but hopefully you guys can get a copy of the book and put it up and show people. It's called The Carnivore Code. It's out now everywhere, and you can see it. It's, it's really, I think it's really going to be a game changer for people because we need, we need people to realize that meat is critical in the human diet, that animal foods are so nutritious and they have been incorrectly vilified so often. Hmm. So I guess just as a last point, um, you know, maybe could you give us just, I know there's of course diet, there's lifestyle, you mentioned getting enough sun, things like this. Um, one thing I've been told also is that stress has a huge toll on your immune system. And so, you know, people stressing out, worrying, things like this, that, it can affect you as well. So, I mean, what are, what are the main things, if people can just go one by one, make sure they got it all in a row, what do you recommend in terms of helping so their immune starts, system staying healthy? Right, starts with diet, nutrient-rich animal foods, okay? Then it's sleep and stress and sunlight. Those are the four things. So, you mentioned sleep, well, we mentioned sleep, you mentioned stress. And again, the hysteria, the, the unabated panic, the fear about all of these things, that's making it worse. That's making us, you know, we're not sleeping well. So it's stress and sleep. So it starts with diet, stress and sleep. Don't worry about this. Eat the foods that you need to eat to have a robust immune system. Get good sleep. Don't stay up at night worrying, you know, fretting and, and wringing your hands. Have a regular schedule for sleep. Sleep well, sleep deeply. If you're not sleeping, understand why you're not sleeping because we know that not sleeping well is going to impair your immune system for sure. We can all remember when we were in college and pulling all-nighters and then getting a cold the next day, right? So I want people to understand that there is power. We have the ability to be healthier humans. And the last one is sunlight. And this is a little controversial as well, but look, I'm going to say it as a physician. Sunlight is good for humans. You should not overexpose yourself to sunlight, but real ultraviolet light we know this is valuable for all of us, for our immune system, for the gut microbiome. This is something we need. We should not be afraid of the sun. I was supposed to be in New York this week. My flight got canceled, not because of coronavirus, but because of a mechanical. And when I was talking to my friends there on Monday, they said it was a beautiful day, one of the be most beautiful days of the year in New York. So I hope everyone listening to this got out in the sun and rolled up their sleeves and got out for a walk in the city on Monday and took advantage of that good sunlight. But don't fear the sun. We know that we have always been in the sun as humans and that real ultraviolet light in moderate doses is very healthy for us. So those are the four things. Starts with a rich a diet rich in animal foods and nutrients. Stress. Don't stress. Don't worry about it. That's what this whole program is about. Don't fear. Don't have hysteria. And then sleep and sun. Have a good lifestyle. And then if you want to add one more, be with people you care about, you know, have a community to support you and do something that you love in your life. Being happy, that improves the immune system too. You know, if you really just are in a position that's good, where you feel happy, where you feel enriched, where you feel self-actualized and passionate about what you're doing, that's going to be good for your immune system too. So right now I'm improving my immune system because I'm super passionate 
about this. And I'm very happy to be able to share this information. And I'm grateful and appreciative to be able to share information that might help people lead better lives. So my immune system is just very excited right now because I get to do things that I care about. So what you're saying is, is that the real secret weapon against the coronavirus may be the American barbecue. <laughs> you know, your meat, get your friends together, go outside, hang out, chill out. <laughs> I think I think you're so right. You're, you're, a, San, you're, you're so a San right. Diego guy. We, we can both appreciate, you know, the beach barbecue. <laughs> yes. Go have a beach yeah. barbecue with your friends. Go in the sun, eat some well-raised meat, eat some grass fed, grass finished meat. Uh, you know, be with your people you care about, be in the sun, maybe do a little exercise and then get to sleep at a reasonable hour. Now, the key is when you go to the barbecue, don't eat the coleslaw, you know, don't eat the junk food. Don't maybe don't have a bun on your burger. I'm not a fan of the grains. And I talk about that in the book as well. But the meat at the barbecue, that's going to be what you need. And eggs, things like this and liver. These are the important foods. But I love that you said that the you know, a, a good barbecue on the beach with your friends, that's going to be the secret weapon. Great. So Dr. Paul, where can people find your book? Where can they learn more, more about your work? So you can find my book, the carnivore code book.com. It's on Amazon. It's called the carnivore code. People can find me at my website, which is carnivoremd.com, And all of my socials are at carnivore MD, Instagram, Twitter, uh, yep. And I've got a podcast myself called Fundamental Health. So they can find me all those places. Right. I hope they'll check out my work. And uh, yeah. Good stuff. So everyone, don't forget, like and subscribe. Click the notification bell. You get alerts when our new videos are up. We need your support. And tune in again. We're going to have some great coverage on the coronavirus going forward while this whole thing's playing out. So stick around. Check out some of our other videos. That said, we'll see you next time.